Uh, we have Helen Lee. And so Helen is a creative technologist and a hardware hacker and head of community at Crowd Supply. And Helen is going to tell us about robot unicorns, uh, moon cello gloves, and open technology. So I'll let Helen take it away. Hello, good afternoon from uh, from Portland. Yes, so let me let me just bring up my slides so uh, you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, one moment. Um, okay, so hopefully you can see my slides now. Um, let me know if you can't see that full screen, um, but. Um, I'm assuming you can, as nobody's interrupted me. Um, so, hello, <laughs> I'm Helen Lee. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am head of community at Crowd Supply, where I work with engineers to help them bring their projects to uh, to market and their open hardware products. Um, I get to work with all sorts of awesome people and scout for open hardware from around the world. Uh, so it's a really fun job. Um, I'm also a massive hardware dork, um, and I make a lot of experimental electronics for fun, some of which I'm going to show to you today. Um, I will tell you that I am not a trained engineer, and that I learned all of the tech that I know in a non-traditional grassroots manner, which is one of the things I really wanted to talk to you um, about today. Um, and I also wanted to talk a little bit about my, um, about my own personal practice of collaboration and openness. Um, including a short tale of how one of my projects changed over the course of its lifetime through a series of collaborations with different people, from art things to education things, from project to product. Um, and I'm also going to take a look at some other cool open source hardware projects from other people. So um, you'll find me on Twitter. You can see the addresses there. Um, and you, there's my email address as well. I'll show the slide at the end. Um, and also just a note to say, at the end of this, there is a slide with links um, to everything that I talk about today. Um, and that slide is up on my GitHub. I will share um, this presentation um, on my Twitter after, after this. Um, so without further ado. Um, let's get going. All right. So this this is a very old project of mine back from uh, from back when I lived in London, which was seems like a very long time ago now. Um, I made this project in a fit of peak about like this really boring mass produced education robot that I was working on, um, which shall remain nameless. Um, but it was like super gendered and super boring, and it did everything you're supposed to do. So um, I wanted to make this robot that. Um, was ineffective and had loads of personality and was really fun. And I made this herd of robot unicorns um, as a reaction to this uh, boring, uh, boring uh, education robots that shall remain nameless. Um, and I made this while I was resident at a hacker space in London called Machines Room. And that's really where my journey with um, open hardware started, was at that maker space. Um, the maker space that I was part of, it had this amazing, uh, it's closed now, you know, landlords um, putting up rent, that's what happens in big cities, but, um, but it had this really amazing culture of openness and sharing, um, not uh, in, in a very grassroots way, right? So people would come in with their tools, they'd be woodworkers, they'd be like origami artists, they'd be all sorts of different people sharing information and sharing knowledge with each other. And it was pretty common for us after a day of work to do, um, collaborations and teaching each other different skills um, between uh, between between different genres, I guess. So it was an incredible experience to have that kind of collaborative um, grassroots learning experience, very much like informal learning, grassroots hacker education, you know, learning how to use an oscilloscope in my friend's kitchen, that kind of situation. And it's really exciting. I actually know loads of people who got their technical education this way in, in recent times through through hacker spaces and through um, through the internet it's pretty exciting so I made this um, I made this um, set of robot unicorns um, and I took it and uh, there's a herd of them there was a herd of these things with different with different patterns different designs different lights different colored horns etc cetera, etc cetera. and I took them on tour around various different institutions and we raced them it was really fun um, and um, at one of the events that I was racing my herd of robot unicorns at, 
um, a, a leather artist came along and she was really excited by the robot unicorns and she was um, and she proposed that we work on a project together and this was the first time I guess I did a proper collaboration like an official collaboration with somebody that completely changed the way in which um, I was working at the time um, so basically what we did was we just sat down together in a room for a weekend and we both um, used our own skill sets to, um, to and we mashed them together to make something that neither of us would have been able to do um, on our own. And it was so beautiful and, and so um, such a fun experience. And I learned so much um, that it made me really, really start to think more about seeking out collaborations on purpose. So at Machines Room, I would do um, evenings and we do um, we would do like um, nail art collaborations together. We did like um, gesture based origami. There was an origami artist who was resident there as well. So, you know, like it was just this really nice culture of two people with very different skill sets coming together to make something that was greater than the sum of their parts. Yeah. So this this experience really kind of um, introduced me to the benefits of um, willful collaboration and explicit openness, which is pretty exciting. Um, so I started seeking out more collaborations on purpose. Um, this was this was the next evolution of um, of this of this uh, robot unicorn technology. We're still using like some of the same code and some of the same ideas, but this time um, I took it along to. Uh, this was actually the last hackathon I ever went to. Um, I'm not a big fan of hackathons. I think they're quite exploitative um, and counterproductive. But um, you do meet some really, really cool people there. And at this particular, at this particular hackathon, I met this really awesome artist called Martine. And um, her job, or her her practice was um, she worked with um, um, sat uh, with a like um, uh, an observatory in in the Netherlands to bounce sounds that she's recorded off the face of the moon and then record what those sounds sound like when you come back which introduced this amazing distortion effect sometimes it completely failed and you've got these really exciting like white noise loops um, it was kind of fun um, anyway I took her piece of work which was making those sounds um, and I introduced it into um, into the glove. So it's now um, this glove um, was then manipulating the sounds that were created by this artist, Martine, and um, using using gesture. Um, and this is when I started um, really collaborating a lot more with other artists. Um, yeah, but also this glove. Then I asked. Um, I asked a very much more established um, artist, an artist called Imogen Heap, who's um, a famous um, Grammy-winning producer and um, and British museum at uh, museum uh, British musician. Um, and um, and I asked her. Um, I saw one of the projects she was working on, and I said, "Hey, would you be up for a collaboration? I've done this. You know, I've been working on these this series of gesture-controlled gloves, and I know that you've got this." really expensive $3,000 Mimu glove, which controls Ableton using gesture and so on. Um, but I'd love to do this for children. Um, I reckon I can get it for under $50. Um, and she was like, yeah, it sounds amazing. Um, and that ended up turning into a project. So this is the, the mini Moo. This is a DIY um, sewable, codable, wireable, um, gesture controlled instrument designed to teach children the basics of learning to code. Um, and this is really fun. This is actually an open source product as well. Um, we've uh, we open source like all of the um, all of the tech that we made in there that's ours, and we also um, released all of the educational materials um, through uh, with a Creative Commons license as well. That was the first time I ever really formalized um, an open source hardware piece of my technology. Before that, like my experiences with open technology were very much more on the you know, like I bought into the ethos, but I never really bothered to go into the details, you know. Openness was very much part of my work, but open source hardware was something that other people did until I did this project. Um, and then, so, so something that was fun after this, so this this has gone out, blah, blah, blah. It's, 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 um, it's available all around the world, which is a complete trip for me to have my, this is my hand, by the way, it's my hand, uh, hand on the box, so a hand model um, always amuses me. Um, but yeah, so, so this, this, this hand, um, 
this this glove, which was designed for children, um, then went out to thousands and thousands of kids. So I mean, like last summer, Red Hat um, sponsored, I think, three thousand um, versions of this kit to go out to um, schools in the UK as part of the um, a tech summer school for people who are disadvantaged. And um, we're doing it again this year as well, but I think it's um, more people. Um, but the thing that was really exciting for me is it, you know, it was doing its the, it was doing its purpose. This was designed to create um, an educational experience for children. But what I hadn't anticipated was by being super open um, with this, it um, actually it became really um, like a musician started using it as well, which is not what I'd intended. I mean, this is a thirty-five dollar kit, right? It's not um, it's not a, you know an official musical instrument. But um, musicians really started playing with it, which was completely unexpected. Um, and this is one of the musicians who does, so this is Bishy. Bishy is like an absolutely iconic, like electric sitar playing goddess who lives in London and basically has the coolest life that you could possibly imagine. You should all buy her album and you should all go follow her on Instagram just for the looks alone, even if you're not a big fan of music. Um, anyway, she started She started using the glove, and she's not. Uh, she wasn't a coder even. Um, she started using the glove in her own work, and she learned to code to be able to use the glove to, and to do things that I would never have even thought of, right? So she, she used the glove to control visuals live on stage, and also to control filters, and to control her own vocal looping live on stage. A thirty-five-dollar children's glove made of, you know, like felt, which really uh, was very exciting to me. Um, but that brings me to my point: is when I open up my work, as I gradually opened it up more and more and more, I realized that actually it's not about giving my work to other people. Like opening up my own work means that I have access to so many things that I don't have, right? Skills I don't have. Think about the leather stitching on that beautiful glove that I made. I would never have been able to do that on my own. But by, by being open and sharing, um, I was able to create something much bigger than the sum of its parts. I get knowledge I don't have all the time, especially if I'm working on a complex technical problem. Like People will chime in and, and offer you help, which is something you don't get if you're just squirreling all of your knowledge away to yourself. It also gives me time I don't have and ideas I don't have. I never would have thought of using a children, a $35 children's glove to do live looping in an art rock situation. You know, it's, it's, it's being open with my work has created something more than just my work, which is really exciting. Um, so, um, here we are. Yeah. So lots and lots of other people, because I, I work in, lot, I've got my toes in quite a lot of different, um, my fingers, I say, <laughs> in lots of different pies, you know, like partially because, you know, um, I write a lot. So as a journalist, um, I, I write for Mate magazine. So as a journalist, I get to be curious about other people's um, technical expertise and, and basically distill it and, and push it back out to other people. So that's super fun. Um, but during like in my work and in the course of my travels um, around the internet um, it's been really exciting to me to see that it's not just me um, lots and lots of people are having exactly the same conversations as I am so I was watching this amazing talk the other day by Tim Ansell um, who is one of my favorite like elite level um, like hacker type people he says like loads of really cool stuff including working on the Skywater PDK which is like removing a huge barrier for open source chip design. So really recommend checking out his work. Anyway, he was giving us talk about um, Tomu, uh, which is one of his products, um, one of his projects. And it's like, it's this, right? It's, uh, it's, it's basically an absolute, it's one next to the, the dime. I don't know why I'm pointing at my screen. You obviously can't see um, what I'm gesturing at. Um, but the, the Tomu is this absolutely teeny wee, teeny tiny little, um, little device um, with a microcontroller and that sits inside your USB device. Now, um, his, he, um, Tim's, uh, Tim's talk was really interesting. He talked about the, uh, the development of this tiny little device, um, about how it was solving a problem for him, and also how um, he couldn't, like he made this piece of hardware, but he couldn't really, you know, he didn't really want to spend the time developing the firmware he wanted for it. 
So he said in this talk that he said that like I'm an open source developer, so I know the solution to this. First, you make the hardware open source. Then you make a lot of your devices and give them out to people. And eventually, somebody was silly enough to write the software that I wanted on the hardware. And I just thought that was such a lovely um, example of somebody who doesn't really necessarily have the time to create something um, in its entirety and hold on to it, able to push it out into the community um, by creating these open hardware devices and then extend it, uh, extend the functionality of that device. So the thing, the cool thing about Tomu is it also had this, it's now created, because it's open hardware as well, it's created this whole range of really awesome things. We've got Tomu, we've got the FOMU, which is the FPGA version, we've got the SOMU, which is the security key one, and then we've got like the Komu and lots of others coming as well, um, including this uh, this one over here um, from Femju. Um, so it's become, because it's open source hardware, it's become this ecosystem of tiny little boards that are all just learning from Helen, each other and iterating on, yeah. I'm gonna give you a couple minutes to, to wrap up here. Yeah, this is my last, this, I've got one more slide. Cool. Yeah, that's good. Um, so it's been really cool to watch like this particular project move from, one guy being annoyed at some expensive hardware to something that has become this whole ecosystem of cool um, tiny boards that fit in your USB port. And together, they've raised some, they've raised over $175,000 in crowdfunding just from this small little ecosystem of boards. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to show, which wasn't going to be in this talk, but it happened last night and I thought it was kind of fun, is uh, this little board here. This is the T-Guard, it's, um, it's a hardware hacking device, uh, very powerful, lots of people love it. Um, and, last, and it's only just gone out, so it's from Portland, it's from, um, it's from Joe Fitz, who's a, who's a security researcher who lives in Portland. And, um, and he sent it out all over the world. And last night, someone in London received their device and they were really excited about it. And they ended up um, creating Last night, while I was sitting around finalizing my slides, they made this um, little case in London. He went to bed. I started printing the same thing. Um, and I just thought it was so cool. It's gone from Portland to London. And then same day, this guy has made this CAD file. I was able to print it out and put my key guard in it. And it's just creating this culture of sharing and openness. All right, so here are all my links. Here are all my links um, for in my slide. This will be in the thing. Um, and there's the end. But basically, so, to summarize, I basically just wanted to say, let me just come back to the, uh, the um, stop the screen so I can actually see everybody. Hello. Um, yeah, so, so basically, the, the, my, the, what I really wanted to say is that open source hardware, in my own personal practice, has enabled like incredible projects and incredible things that I never would have been able to do on my own. And, and also, the, um, the, the ecosystem around open source is now becoming, so, uh, open source hardware is becoming so much more healthy. Um, there's loads of people getting involved. There's people actually making a living from it. It's all really, really exciting. Um, and openness is just basically the future. Like information wants to be free and learning wants to be shared. This is, you know, this is, this is definitely, the, the openness is the future. So I'm really excited to see um, how the open source hardware community develops over the next few years. I think it's, uh, I'm very happy that I'm part of it. So yeah, um, let me know. Uh, this, that's it. That's it. <laughs> I will put the I'll put these slides on Twitter. Um, and thank you for that 15 minutes. <laughs> it was a very rapid fire talk. <laughs> You're welcome, Helen. <laughs>